Okay. Uh, well, I don't really have a talk. Uh, I'm calling in from London, and, and uh, but I was involved with uh, Ivan's first head mounted display that he did in the late 60s, first at Harvard, and uh, then at Utah, when I was a graduate student there, I helped work on some of the math. A um, couple of interesting things about that display is that right over your ears were two CRTs heading backwards, uh, each one with about 15,000 volts crackling away. And so you had a real sense and knowledge of when this thing was on. The positioning was done either by a physical uh, device that was called the Sword of Damocles, which was kind of a gimbaled set of uh, metal bars hung up on, up the, on the ceiling, so your head felt like it had a mass of um, a couple of cannonballs or what was called the shower head, which is where you wore an ultrason uh, ultrasonic sensor and there was a thing floating above your head. They actually put one on a crane so they could follow you around when you were walking around. And there was a thing you could hold in your hand. You could interact with the display that was there. And the uh, speed of computation of the uh, 3D transformations and clipping that needed to be done was fast enough. That uh, 3D transformations and the clipping were done by literally multiple racks of equipment because no CPU that was uh, readily available was anywhere near fast enough to do that in real time. So in one sense, uh, uh, virtual reality uh, augmented reality has come far since Ivan wrote what I think of as the still the definitive paper on it, which uh, he called the ultimate display. It was written in 1965. So that was more than 50 years ago. And he wrote it while he was doing a stint in the uh, uh, running IPTO projects. And after he got out of it, that was a two-year stint that he had there. After he got out, he went to Harvard and decided to build all of the stuff necessary for making this ultimate display. The other way of looking at it is, I'll uh, come up in a, in a second. Uh, in 1968 was when I had the Dynabook idea. After uh, meeting Seymour Papert and seeing what he was doing with children, and I pictured it as a tablet because I thought that would be the best thing for children to carry around with them. But I also thought that before we got a good flat screen display this size, that flat screen displays this size would be done, in part because uh, the contamination and yield was much, much better on small pieces of silicon back then, still is. So it's basically been an accident of history that uh, head mounted displays didn't happen much, much earlier and much, much better. Uh, the third theory of the Dynabook, book, besides the tablet and the head mounted thing with your computer in your pocket, was one I got from Nicholas Nikopati, where he said, well, not too long from now, there will be nodes everywhere in the world, and so all you need to wear is maybe an ID bracelet so the system can tell where you are, how you're pointing with your hand, and your computer will effectively just follow you around the world as you go. Well, we aren't at that point yet, but some years later that was called uh, ubiquitous computing, and it's clear we're going in that direction also, where you wind up automatically co-opting any display that happens to be around. Well, the interesting thing is, 51 years later, to me, it is really surprising just how bad, badly done our 
pretty much all of the uh, HMDs, uh, particularly three huge mistakes besides just not paying enough attention to the problem. One of them is that on most of them, I think not all of them, but on most of them, the focal length is such that your eyes are not being forced to focus out, but instead are essentially looking fairly close. And one of the effects there is you get to see the pixels there rather than the pictures much too readily. And if you do that, you need a heck of a lot of pixels. Um, and so you've got this thing that takes you out of whatever uh, simulated world you're in. The uh, second one, which is a big one, and it's crazy that it hasn't been addressed until recently, is having a big enough visual angle. So unlike John, I, didn't, I thought Google Glass was terrible. Huge, I mean, just like not understanding what the problem even is or what you should, should be doing, because it had a tiny little field of view. That is not what you want. And psychologically, it is really important to get to those pixels that are outside the phobia. And I believe that most people working on these displays up to the present actually don't understand very much about human vision. It's not, knowledge of human vision is not really portrayed very strongly in most of these displays. The exception is the reality display that uh, David Smith has been doing at Reality. That one has a generous field of view and you get some of these wonderful effects. By the way, if you have a wide field of view, you will get 3D stereo if you watch a movie monocularly. This is something that Ivan knew a long time ago. Ivan is blind in one eye, the father of computer graphics. And so he, in, what he wanted was he was going to rely on things like kinetic depth effect and uh, motion parallax and uh, wide field of view to give these different effects. But it's, it's, if you take one of David Smith's uh, Fresnel lenses that has a very wide field of view, you just look at a, a movie with one eye, uh, you'll get very, very good 3D effects because our brain does not see what's on our retina, but sees what we believe about things, what we know about things, the motion cues that come from the peripheral vision, which is legally blind out there. I think that's why perhaps people don't pay attention to it. But it happens to be 100 times more sensitive to brightness change. And it causes various kinds of cicading in the eyes and a coupling to the way we think about the world that vastly changes what the uh, subjective effect is of, of having a display. And of course, the other thing that is also kind of shocking today is how still poorly done most of the head position sensing is done, and if there's anything that is learned early on about head-mounted displays is not doing the head positioning sensing well not only detracts from the virtual reality part of the thing, but it actually induces vertigo, it induces headaches. There are many well-known things about it, and today I don't think there's any real excuse technologically for not doing it. Uh, head position sensing uh, perfectly. So those three things really, I mean, basically I think it's because people who are kind of dabbling at it uh, got into the technology and people are now perhaps just starting to take it seriously after 51 years. Now, I'll mention one, one fourth thing, which was something that I was really excited about 50 years ago, and that is the potential of uh, a head-mounted display for giving you an infinite expanse of 2D pixels. I like the 3D stuff, and there are a lot of things you can do with 3D. But to me, there's never enough surface 
maybe it's two and a half deep, but there's never enough surface for doing work on it. So all of the displays we have today are tiny little things. You know, I did the overlapping windows idea because we couldn't get enough pixels on the screen, and we still can't. And then the, the screen I'm looking at right now has a very narrow angle on it. So this idea of being able to have large two-dimensional surfaces for doing things on working and planning and so forth is something that has hardly been exploited. I haven't, uh, somebody will probably know more than I do about what's being done right now. Um, so the last idea here, the fourth one, is just something for people to think about. And that is where do we want the augmentation to happen? So a lot of our tools are external. And so my, my vision of this is today is a basically cave people or monkeys working with nuclear weapons. <laughs> external tools about doing something about what's between the ears is an ever-growing disaster. And if anything, the latest uh, election should show us that. This is a terrible uh, situation. So what we don't want is the same old brain with uh, millions of times more power. As what we want is to augment our brains internally to give us the perspective uh, to use this power. And maybe a good way to end this is to end with a great quote of Phi Hart, where she said, what we want is for human wisdom to exceed human power. Thank you very much.